All right. Good morning. Oh, that was a good one. Good job. Hey, welcome to the series. Nope. Welcome to the series, Uncomfortable. Let me start off by saying the title is not by accident. This series is very uncomfortable. The Christian life, especially when it comes to being part of a church community, is full of discomfort and awkwardness. But in spite of that discomfort, in spite of that awkwardness, we were created to live and serve and grow in community. And so we have to embrace the uncomfortable parts of life, the uncomfortable people, the uncomfortable silence, and the uncomfortable conversations in order to actually live out the life that Christ is calling us to. So I want to prepare you, I want you to be prepared, because this series is going to make you uncomfortable. That's the goal. It might actually offend you a little. But the truth is, much of our lives are lived for us. But the truth is, the church isn't about us. The church isn't about you. Now, before you go amening me and saying, yeah, I, I believe that, let's get a little uncomfortable for a moment. Raise your hand if you grew up in church. Let me, let me add a clarifying statement to that. Uh, I began attending church in the, summer, or the spring of fifth grade. I've been a born-again believer for over 20 years, so I would say even though I didn't go as a baby, I grew up in church. So who's grown up in church? Raise your hand. Okay. So raise... If you rose your hand, this, this question is for you. We're going to ask you some questions about those of you who have grown up in church. Okay? When you were going to church, what type of music did you sing growing up? Hymns. We, uh, hymns. Okay? When you were going to church growing up, how did you gain knowledge or understanding of the scripture? Sunday school. Okay. Now, growing up, what type of seats did you sit on? Pews. Were they comfortable? Absolutely not. They were hard. It was hard to fall asleep when the preacher was preaching. Uh, okay. If you were a kid, what did you do over the summer? You went to VBS, VBS right? Now, how many services did you have growing up in your church? One, right? Now, I had four or five. I can't remember which. Uh, but most of us had one, okay? So this is what it was like growing up in the church. What else? What are some other things that define your early church experience? What? Summer camp, right? We went to camp. It was fun. It was hot. Anything else? Potlucks. All oh, right. I'm glad someone said it. I've enjoyed a few potlucks in my day. Anything else? Okay, that's not typical, it's not a typical church experience, maybe for some of us. Sword drills, there we go, okay. If you were here last week for Kids Takeover, we did a sword drill, it was awesome, I won. Anything else? What? Tight, okay, so like you had to dress in an appropriate way, so there's specific dress code, Okay. What else? Choir. Choir. Yeah. And more specifically, kids' choir, right? You got to listen to those kids sing at Christmas Eve even though they don't know the words. Christmas what else? Christmas program. Okay, that, that kids' choir. What else? Ice cream sandwiches. Uh, no, I didn't get ice cream. I, ever, last hour, people were talking about homemade ice cream at their church. I didn't get homemade ice cream. 
Long monologues, okay. What else? Huh? Kids clubs, kids clubs right? Some sort of uh, kids programming. Yeah, our, our worship was usually defined by piano or organ music, right? Old hymns. Remember the, like, the little projectors where you slide the little overhead on and then put it upside down and have to rotate it around because you didn't know what you were doing, right? So, <laughs> huh? No, there's no sermons up here. You're the only, you didn't know one even said it last time either. Sermons. <laughs> They're very forgettable, I understand. Okay? Now, baptisms. Okay, we didn't hear that one last hour either. This hour is more holy. I got gotcha. you. Bibles? Oh, I thought you said Bibles. I'm like, well, I hope so. Uh, revivals. Yeah, there are Bibles there too, I hope. Anything else? Altars, yeah, altars. Yeah, I wish we had an altar. I'd like it. What? Crosses. Crosses. Yep. A picture of Jesus. Usually blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus. Not historically or biblically accurate at all. Okay? Now, here's, here's what I want you to see. This is what it was like growing up in church, okay? Now, I want you to look at some of the biggest complaints I hear every single week on a weekly basis here, right? Why don't we sing hymns in our church? When are we going to bring back Sunday school? Why don't we do VBS anymore? Why do we have multiple services on a Sunday? Now, I'm not saying you can't ask those questions, okay? You can ask those questions, but if you do, I want to tell you the answers to some of those. Let's start with the question of hymns, right? I grew up on hymns. I love hymns. You might not know this, but I actually have a hymnal collection in my house. Okay? This is the hymnal that I used growing up. Okay? Don't ask me how I got it. People asked last hour. People watching online. They don't use them anymore at the church I grew up in, so I took one. Okay? They're getting rid of it. It's not a sin. All right? They were getting rid of it. They just gave it to me instead without knowing it. I'm going to pay for this later when someone watches this. Anyway, so this is the hymnal I grew up with, right? They put the number on the screen. You open it up to the hymnal, right? Okay. Now, also, this is a hymnal from this church, a very old hymnal from this church, right? It's still got High Hill Christian Church in it from 1964. It's got a little mold in it. This one wasn't loved very well, sorry. Uh, but it is a hymnal from this church. I also have a hymnal from my first lead pastor, the church that I grew up in, their first hymnal I got when he passed away. So I have a hymnal collection. I love hymns. I grew up singing hymns. The church that I went to uh, sang hymns. The college, Bible college I went to sang hymns. They're an in instrumental part of my life. And, and we try to sing hymns here. In fact, I asked Dee, our worship ministry director, how many weeks in the last 12 months have we sung a hymn? Because I don't really know the names of songs and stuff. That's why I love they put the numbers up there. Um, and so I asked her, how many, how many hymns have we sung in the last 12 months? Can anybody guess how many? You're such a cheater. <laughs> 29 in the last 12 months. He's here last hour. Cheater. <laughs> cheater. Okay. Uh, oh, you weren't paying attention. Thank you. I'm rethinking this quickly. Uh, now, since D has been serving as our worship ministry director in the interim and officially the past 10 months, we've actually sung 23 hymns in the last 40 weeks. Okay? So that's a hymn every other week. So do we sing hymns? Yes, we do. Are they the only thing we sing? No. no, they are not. Our worship music is not picked at random. Dee and her team put a lot of prayer and effort into choosing the songs that lead us into the presence of God, and that is what matters. Do hymns do that? Yes, they do. Are they the only way to do that? No, they are not. 
If I'm completely honest with the worship songs that we sing here, I don't love every song we sing in this church. In fact, there are a few that I could do without. But those few that I don't prefer, others do. And if they bring honor to God and allow people to connect with God through worship, I'm okay with that. Because, you see, it's not really about what I like. Because the truth of the matter is, church isn't about me. Now, what about Sunday school? When is Sunday school coming back? Well, here's the answer. It's not. Would we like the ability to do an adult connection group on a Sunday morning? Yes. Then why don't we do it? Well, first of all, space. Our building is not designed to accommodate adult groups because we have so many kids and students in family ministry. Did you know that of the 130 unique people that we see every week on average on a Sunday morning, there are 38 kids and students on average every week. But of the 150 unique people that we see on a regular basis that we consider to be a regular part of our church, of those 150 unique people, there are actually 50 kids and students. So that means one-third of our church is made up of kids and students, which is awesome. It's incredible, but they take up a lot of space, right? <laughs> Just being honest, okay? But, but why don't we go back to one service so that we can all be together in one room, and then, then we can have Sunday school again? Well, what about the 25 volunteers who serve in family ministry, do they have to miss out on worship and a message just so that we can all be together in one room? Or what about the 19 people on average who come only to the 9 a.m. worship experience on Sunday? Would they come if we only had one? Maybe. But how many would we miss? But even if we were all together in one room, even if we went back to one worship experience on Sunday and we went back to Sunday school it's not what's best for the whole body. It's not the most effective way for us to reach the people that God is sending us. So even if it's something we prefer, church isn't about us. Pews. Anybody make an argument for wanting pews back? No. Yeah, no. I don't think anybody would logically make an argument for hard pews over comfortable seats. But if someone were to make an argument in that way, I would say our building is so multi-use that the pews would be very inconvenient to move every week. A pew would actually hinder our ability to do what God has called us to because the reality is no one would want to move them every week. Now what about VBS? I grew up going to VBS. In fact, my first Bible I got right before VBS that summer of fifth grade. Yeah, I even have notes from my Sunday school class in my Bible. So what about VBS? Everybody loves VBS. Kids love to go to VBS. That's true. There are, there are a lot of churches in our community do, who do VBS. What about them? Why can't we do VBS? If they do it, why can't we? Well, let me start by saying VBS is an instrumental part of my faith journey. And what I'm about to say is not a criticism of those churches that do VBS. It very well may be an essential part of the vision that God has given to them, but it's not part of the vision that God has called us to. And just because everyone else is doing it, just because it's something we've done in the past, doesn't mean that it's something we should continue to do. My question is, what is the purpose of VBS? Is it outreach into our community? If that's the case, then it wouldn't be very effective. Many people hop from VBS to VBS all summer long, my kids included. But from my experience, they're either transplants from another church or parents are using it as childcare, which is fine. And there are exceptions, yes. There are exceptions, but having led VBS for hundreds of kids at a time in churches all over the country for many years, I can tell you that I have found that as an outreach, VBS is not effective. There are other things 
that bear much more fruit. And sometimes we have to prune what is good in order to institute something that bears more fruit. But what about using VBS to disciple kids? It could be a cool a tool to do that, but there are actually more effective ways for us to disciple kids. Things like camp and kids takeover, which I've heard a lot about lately, over the last week, since we just had a kids takeover, and to which I would say to those people, church is not about you. A third of our church is kids and students. And having a service four times a year that's designed specifically for them and their family is not going to harm you. In fact, you might learn something. Don't say that you want to be a church that is growing, a church that is reaching the next generation, and then complain when we do something to reach the next generation. We are a church that invests in the future. It's a core value of our church. So we're going to keep doing things to reach the next generation and the next generation and the next generation after that. Whatever it takes that brings honor to God and reaches someone different than me. Because the reality is church is not about me. It's not about you either. In fact, that brings me to our series verse. And this is just how cool the Holy Spirit works. Normally I write the communion meditations every week, but this week I didn't. And uh, Jason pulled one out that he already had written from probably years ago. And the verse he referenced in it is the same verse that I'm going to share that is the key verse for this series. It's just his verse was from Luke and mine is from Matthew. But that's how the Holy Spirit works. He's connecting things even without us trying, right? So Matthew 16, 24 says this, Gen Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now notice Jesus doesn't say, To follow him, we have to do church the way that we've always done it. The way that we're used to doing it. The way that is most comfortable to us. In fact, he actually says the exact opposite of that. He says we have to deny ourselves, which is the opposite of what our culture teaches us. See, we live in this have-it-your-way culture, this be-who-you-want-to-be culture. And our culture wants us to make church about us. Our culture wants us to make everything about us. The universe revolves around me, right? That's how God designed it. But what does the Bible say about it? Well, in Proverbs 1, in talking about the way of sinners, the enticement of us to follow the ways of those around us, in Proverbs 1.15 it says this, My son, do not walk in the way with them. Hold back your foot from their paths. Romans 12.2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. So we shouldn't be trying to live the way the world does. We shouldn't be living our lives for ourselves because it's not about us. Church is not about us. We have to deny ourselves and take up our cross to follow Jesus. Now you might be asking, so how do we do that? What does it look like to follow Jesus? Well, over the past several months, our elders and staff have been praying and talking through, what does that look like? And we've developed this uh, with the help of the elders, this next steps pathway. Now I'm not going to read everything to you. You should see a handout somewhere on a seat around you. It looks like this. And on the back of it, there are some more details about more details about each step on the pathway. But I do want to walk through the pathway with you really quick. Because this pathway assumes that you don't know Jesus at all. Okay? So the first step on the pathway is you attend a community event. Right? That could be anything like the Back to School Bash or the Great Pumpkin Party or any sort of community event we do. And then after that, hopefully, you begin to attend a worship experience on a Sunday morning. 
And then after that, hopefully the Holy Spirit has led you to a point where you're ready to accept Christ as your Lord and Savior. And then after you accept Christ, you're going to follow Him in baptism. And then after that, we want you to come to a Connect Night, which is happening next Sunday night at 5 p.m. We want you to, to understand who we are as a church, what we believe, what we value, and what it means to follow Jesus. And then after you come to a Connect Night, we, we want you to become a covenant partner. We want you to say, this is my family, and I want to do life with them. And then after you become a covenant partner, then you begin to develop some spiritual habits, things like prayer and Bible study and fasting and solitude, all those spiritual disciplines that help you mature in your faith. And then hopefully you begin to read Scripture together in community. We do you version plans every single week. In fact, there's one in your bulletin. You can scan the QR code on the front, and you can read God's Word together with us in community. And then after that, we hope you begin to attend an Engage event like Zumba or our Men's Engage Monthly on the first Saturday of every month or some Women's Engage things that we're coming up with or Beast Feast, which is an Engage conference for men. And then after you come to an Engage event, we hope that you will join a connection group, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. And then after a connection group, we want you to attend an Encounter Weekend. And you'll notice that the Encounter Weekend is a different color. Red is the connect with God and blue is connect with others. That's because Encounter Weekends are, even though you're together with a group of men or women, they're not really about connecting with other people. They're about you encountering the living God and experiencing the Holy Spirit in a way that you never have before. So it's a very private experience, even though you're in a group of people. And then, then after that, we hope that you begin to give regularly. And you might say, well, why is that on there? Well, we don't need your money. We don't need you to give. But we do know that giving is a marker of maturity in your faith. And as you begin to mature in your faith, as you begin to connect more to this family, you will begin to give. It's a marker of that. Then after that, we hope you begin to discover your spiritual gifts. And we have tests online that you can take to help you do that. But the best way to understand what spiritual gifts the Holy Spirit has given you is to ask Him, Holy Spirit, what gifts have you given me? To study Scripture and understand what gifts He has available. And then hopefully after you know what your gifts are, you begin to connect in a serve team. And then after that, we want you to identify your one, someone that you are caring for and praying for and sharing your story with, someone who doesn't have a thriving relationship with Jesus Christ. And after you have identified who that person is, we want to help you learn how to share your story. We want you to understand how to share your faith, how to share your testimony, how to share the gospel. And then after that, we want you to begin serving with love out loud. And then after that, we want you to begin to engage in missions. Things like mission trips and supporting our missions partners, writing letters to encourage them, things like that. Now here's what I want you to know. People are going to walk down this path in a various different ways, okay? But if we're all honest, we're all somewhere on this path. All of us are somewhere on this path. Now some of us have skipped a few steps. Some of, some of us have walked around in different orders, but all of us are somewhere on this path. And for those who are at the very beginning of the path, welcome to the journey. To those who are at the very end of the path, I want you to hear this. You haven't arrived yet. You've still got growing and maturing to do. There's still more growing for you. But for those who are somewhere in the middle, somewhere on this path, here is the challenge. Take the next step. Take the next step. See, here's the thing about being part of a local church. It takes commitment, which goes against everything that our culture tells us. To commit to a local church as a for better or worse family. Where is that found? For better or worse? I've heard that before. It's a marriage, right? Yeah, we are the bride of Christ. So we're entering into a for better or worse relationship with Christ and his body. To commit to a local church as a forever 
are for a better or worse family being loyal regardless of whether cooler churches or celebrity pastors move in down the street is truly countercultural. Look at 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. It says, But if we walk in the light, as He is the light, He being Jesus, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all sin. So if we walk in the light, who is Jesus, that means we will have a relationship with Jesus, whose blood purifies us from sin, and we will also have fellowship with one another. See, the Christian life cannot be an individual affair. The church, other believers, are a necessary part of your spiritual life. You cannot say, I love Christ, but not the church. I'll say that again, because someone's going to watch this online, and they're going to say, I love Jesus, but I don't want to go to church, because church people are messed up, hypocritical, right? I, I, tell me you haven't said it before or haven't heard it before. You cannot say, I love Jesus Christ, but not the church. You can't say it. Because here's the thing. In Ephesians 5.23, it says, Christ is the head of the church, his body, and he himself is its savior. So there's this relationship. Christ is part of the body. And the body, the church, is part of Christ. You can't separate them. Otherwise, you have a body walking around without a head. Right? If you are a born-again believer, and you say, I love Jesus, He is my Lord and Savior, but I hate going to church because those people are messed up, amen. They are messed up. We're messed up people. I'm a messed up person. But you cannot separate Jesus from the church or the church from Jesus. It's not possible. You cannot follow Christ and not love the church. That doesn't mean you don't like have to like every part of it. But you can't follow Jesus and not love the church. Because the reality is many of us have done this. Many believers like, hey, I'm just going to do church at home. I'll just do church at home. It's easier. I like my family most of the time. Right? There's a lot of people who do that, especially post-COVID. There are hundreds of people, thousands of people who are just doing church at home. You can't do that. There are, there are people who prioritize sports and school and social outings over their commitment to the church. And this is going to be hard to hear. But those things are not more important than being a part of the church, being together with other believers. Now, it doesn't mean you can't go to church or can't go on vacation or miss a Sunday. But many of us attend church when it's convenient, not because it's a priority. Now, yes, there are aspects of our faith journey that are very individual. But the purpose of the cross... You know, the cross that we're supposed to deny ourselves and pick up every single day. That cross, the purpose of the cross was not to save me, an individual, but to create a new community whose members belong to Jesus Christ, who love one another and who eagerly, save, who eagerly serve the world. Yes, Jesus died for me, but he didn't just die for me, he died for you. He died for all of us. And his goal wasn't just to save you from hell. His goal was to build a community of people who love him, who are his light in the world, who are a testimony of his love to people who are dying and going to hell every single day. Over a hundred times in the New Testament, it talks about how we are to interact with one another. And that assumes that we have to be together in order to interact with one another. In fact, 59 times in the Bible, it gives very specific instructions on how we are to relate to each other. And I've printed them out for you in your bulletin. So if you want to open it up, this whole list, on this side of the bulletin, 
are 59 of those times. Here's what it says. Love one another. John 13, 34. This command is found at least 16 times in Scripture. Be devoted to one another. Romans 12, 10. Honor one another above yourselves. Romans 12, 10. Live in harmony with one another. Romans 12, 16. Build up one another. Romans 14, 19. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. Be like-minded towards one another. Romans 15, 5. Accept one another. Romans 15, 7. Admonish one another. Romans 15, 14. And Colossians 3, 16. Greet one another. Romans 16, 16. Care for one another. 1 Corinthians 12, 25. Serve one another. Galatians 5, 13. Bear one another's burdens. Galatians 6, 2. Forgive one another. Ephesians 4, 2. Ephesians 4.32 and Colossians 3.13. Be patient with one another. Ephesians 4.2 and Colossians 3.13. Speak the truth in love. That's hard conversations. Ephesians 4.15 and Ephesians 4.25. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Ephesians 4.32. Speak to one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Ephesians 5.19. Submit to one another. Ephesians 5.21. 1 Peter 1.5. 1, Consider others better than yourselves. Philippians 2.3. That's denying yourself. Look to the interests of one another. Philippians 2.4. Bear with one another. Colossians 3.13. Teach one another. Colossians 3.16. Comfort one another. 1 Thessalonians 4.18. Encourage one another. 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Exhort one another. Hebrews 3.13. Stir up provoke, stimulate one another to love and good work. Hebrews 10, 24, show hospitality to one another. 1 Peter 4, 9, employ the gifts that God has given you for the benefit of one another. 1 Peter 4, 10, close yourselves with humility towards one another. 1 Peter 5, 5, pray for one another. 5, James 5, 16, and confess your, salt, your faults one to another. James 5, 16, how's everybody doing? Everybody doing a good job of one another and anybody? No? Am I the only one who sucks at this? <laughs> Just ask it. Everybody's doing great at it? Just me? No. Right? This is hard. It's hard to be patient when with, on, with one another when they're irritating you. Right? Uh, but, but wait, it goes on. Scripture also says, do not lie to one another. Colossians 3, 9. Stop passing judgment on one another. Romans 14, 13. If you keep on biting and devouring each other, you will be destroyed by each other. Galatians 5.15 Let us not be conceited and pro provoking one another to envy each other. Galatians 5.26 Do not slander one another. James 4.11 Don't grumble against each other. James 5.9 How anybody else? Anybody doing good on these two? Right? If anybody's perfect at this, please leave the church because you're going to mess it up for all of us because we're all bad at this, right? This is hard. It's hard to be in community with people. People are messy. People are dumb. People do dumb things, right? It's hard to be, I mean, I'm just being honest. Can I be honest? It's hard to be in community with people. But we do all of this with the understanding that we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. See, that means you just can't show up. Being a part of the body means active participation, not just attendance. See, the verse that I read from Romans 12 just now is from the larger context of that chapter, which is all about presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice to God and using our gifts to build up the body of Christ. See, attendance does not make you any more a part of the body than attending a concert makes you a rock star, right? I can go to a rock star all day long, or to a rock concert all day long. I can dance and sing my heart out. I'm not a rock star. You don't want to hear or see that. <laughs> Trust me. But attending church does not make you a part of the body. It doesn't. It requires participation, not attendance. Attendance does not make you a part of the body. Being part of the body requires a commitment. It goes beyond Sunday morning worship experiences, which are supposed to be a time of celebration and instruction. But they are meant to be windows into the Christian community. They're not real community. 
Look at those passages that I just read to you. All of those one another passages. Now you tell me, can you do most of those on a Sunday morning while you're staring at the back of someone's head in service? Sleeping? No. You can't do most of those on Sunday morning. You can only do those when you commit to be in community. Galatians 6, 2 compels us to carry one another's burdens. In this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. Well, how are you going to carry my burdens if you have no idea what they are? How are you going to do that? Well, the only way you can do that is if you are in community, if you're a part of a connection group. Community happens in circles, not rows. And we have to embrace the difficult and uncomfortable parts of life We have to strive for authenticity, one of our values, in order to grow in our faith. And this can only happen in connection groups. And our team has worked very hard over the last few months defining and creating opportunities for you to be in community with other believers in the church. And we're about to start a new season of ministry this fall. And and with that new season of ministry, we are kicking off five new connection groups. Connection groups that meet on Sundays and Tuesdays and Wednesdays. So here's what they are. On Sunday nights, Ryan and Jessica Hall are starting a connection group in September in their home for couples. Not young couples, not old couples, couples. Whether you're dating someone, you're engaged to someone, you're married to someone, you wish you weren't married to someone, whatever in between... If you consider yourself a couple, then this connection group's for you. It's meeting in their home. Now, we also have options at the High Hill campus. On Sunday nights, we have an option for young adults, those in the 18 to 25-year-old age range, not the 17 to 26-year-old age range, 18 to 25, 18 out of high school. So if you're an 18-year-old, you're still in high school, you're not a young adult, you're still a high schooler, okay? Okay? That's happening on Sunday nights here at the High Hill campus. Josh and Trisha Waters are leading that connection group. We also have a connection group that's meeting on Tuesday nights for those who are seasoned. That means you're 55 and older. You can be married, single, or anywhere in between. If you're 55 and older, then this connection group is for you. And Dave and Shirley Lynch are leading that connection group here at the High Hill campus on Tuesday nights. And then we have connection groups that meet on Wednesday nights. We got a couples connection group that Kent and Dee Hall are leading, and a couples connection group that Jason and Heather Pearson are leading. And it's for couples. Not old couples, not young couples, not middle aged couples, couples. If you're a couple, then this connection group's for you, right? Now, unless you're in fifth grade and below, and then not for you because we have a WANA, right? And if you're dating, never mind, I'm not going there. <laughs> Refraining. If you're a couple, this connection group's for you on Wednesday night. But we also have a connection group that we call the Mixed Connection Group. And Stephen and Mackenzie are leading that. It's on Wednesday nights. And it's for anybody. You can be married, single, dating, anywhere in between, black, yellow, white, red, purple, people eaters. I don't care. (laughs) The Mixed Connection Group is for you. So there are opportunities for all of us to get connected, whether we're a couple, whether we're single, whether we're young, whether we're old, there's an opportunity for us to connect. Here's the truth of the matter. Here's the uncomfortable thing to say. It's time for us to stop playing Christianity. It is impossible for us to be in Christ and not belong to people. Attendance is not enough. You cannot claim to love Christ and avoid people. I'll say it again. If you are a born-again believer, you cannot claim to love Christ and avoid people. Individual faith shrinks our experience of God and saps the full power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And here's the truth of the matter. There is no perfect church out there. There's no church that will have the perfect worship style, the perfect preaching preference, our perfect values, or even the perfect demographic makeup that you're looking for. There's no perfect church out there. This church 
is not the perfect church for me, and I'm the pastor. But here's the thing. Church is not about me. Church is not about you. It's about Jesus. Amen. And there is no perfect church that you will find. And if there is, please leave, because you're going to mess it up for them. There's no church that's going to check every single box of your perfect preferences, because the truth is, church is not about you. So here's the thing. What's the next step? If church is not about me, and the world tells me to make church about me and what I prefer, and this church isn't got everything that I prefer in it, what do I do? Here's the challenge. As we move into our time of response, I want to ask you to make a commitment to a commitment to this community, this imperfect, broken messed up community that we call High Hill Christian Church. We're messed up people here. Don't make no mistake, we're not perfect. We mess up. We sin just like you do. But I want you to make a commitment to community. I want you to look at this discipleship pathway. I want you to see where you are on this pathway. And I want you to circle it. Whatever step you're on, whether at the beginning, the end, or somewhere in between, I want you to circle the step you're on on this pathway. And then in a moment, as we continue worshiping, I want to encourage you and challenge you to take the next step. Whatever that next step is on your pathway, I want to encourage you to take it today. If that next step is making Jesus the Lord of your life and following him, him in baptism, then I want to invite you to come up. There will be people up here who would love to have that conversation with you. If your next step is going to a connect, I want to invite you to come next week, 5 p.m. here in this room. We're going to have a connect. If your next step is becoming a covenant partner, I have the covenant par partner document for you. We can talk through it and you can sign it today if that's your next step. But whatever your next step is, I want you to make a commitment to take it. And when you're ready to do that, up here in the front, you'll see these little tennis shoes. They're little keychain tennis shoes. And when you're ready to take the next step, whatever that next step is, I want you to come down to the front and grab one of these tennis shoes as a reminder that I'm going to take the next step. And then once I take that step, I'm going to take the next step and the next step and the next step because being in community is a priority for me. Because being in relationship with Jesus Christ is a priority for me. So I'm going to take the next step. So I want to invite you to do that. And then there's another part. I want to invite you to take the next step by joining a connection group. We can make all the excuses all day long. I don't have time. I get home from work. I'm tired. I really don't want to go back out. What do I do with my kids? How do I feed them? I don't really want to hang around people who are messed up. I mean, you can make every excuse in the book. But the truth is, you cannot say that you love Christ and avoid people. You cannot say, I love Jesus, but I don't love the church. It doesn't work like that. So I want to invite you to join a connection group. There is a connection group for everyone. And it's going to take a commitment. It might not be on the best night of week for you. You might have to give up some things. Maybe your kid can't play in 10 different sports. Maybe you need to get home from work on time. I, I told you you're going to be uncomfortable. I said I was going to say some things that are going to be hard to hear. Connection groups have got to be a priority in your life. Because we cannot walk this life alone. I'm telling you, I've done it. I have been to church before, and I've come in, and I've war I'm warmed the pew and I scoot out early so no one talks to me before the service is done. I 
done that. Come in late, leave early. I've done that. You know how hard life is to live like that? We need each other. We are designed to be in community, to grow and live and serve together in community. And it's time for us to stop playing Christianity, to stop saying we love Jesus and just warm pews. We've got to get connected. We've got to be a part of the family. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22 says this, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. That's the church. Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple to the Lord. In him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. See, the truth is we're all individual stones. We all have our individual personalities. We all have our individual preferences. We all have our individual gifts. We all have our individual experiences. But we are all stones that Jesus is trying to build the church with. And by ourselves, we are nothing but a stone collecting moss. Together, Christ is building us to the structure, a holy temple to God as members of the household of faith. We are called to be together. And that's the challenge for you to take the next step and for you to commit to be in community with other people. God, I thank you for this church. I thank you for the testimony of what this church has done over the years, 116 years of ministry that you have allowed us to change our community. But God, we've got to change us. Because in 116 years, this church has changed a lot. We're in a totally different place with you. On a totally different path. And I am grateful that you have allowed me to be part of that. But the truth is, the church had to change and so do we. Because we are the church. We are the body. And we cannot continue to make church about us. So forgive us for doing that, Lord. Forgive us for making it about us. Forgive us for wanting things our way. Whether it's the songs we sing or the service times that we worship at or the people that we do life with. Whatever it is, God, forgive us for making it about us. It's not about us at all, Lord. It's about you. So God, as we move into our time of response, I pray that you press on our heart. What is that next step we need to take? And give us the boldness to take it. And how do we need to change our commitment to you? By committing to each other. By being in community. By being in connection groups. Challenge us, Lord, to get out of our comfort zones. Commit to what you're calling us to. In Jesus' name.